My name is Doug Pierce. Uh, I'm a lead fellow. I've been uh, with Perkins & Will for 21 years and I've been practicing architectures uh, for over 30. I actually studied sustainable design when I was in college. Even before the UN had minted the word sustainability and exactly what it was, we were studying it. If we don't reduce our carbon footprint and we let climate change just run, the impacts will get beyond our capacity to adapt. We won't be able to adapt. So energy efficiency and fossil fuel re reductions are foundational to not just sustainability, but resilience as well. We have to start dealing with the weather extremes. And here in Minnesota, our, probably our biggest threat is extreme rain. Because Sandy was, had gone down, we had this big rain event in Duluth, and for me, it was like, all right, it's here. Climate change is not something, it's clearly not something that we can talk about as being impactful in the future. It's happening very clearly now and it's dangerous. As designers and architects and planners, we have a responsibility to start dealing with it. So when we look at our climate and our energy goals, a substantial amount of our energy and a substantial amount of our climate impact is the result of the energy we use in buildings. Approximately 71% of the greenhouse gases that the city as a whole emits come from electricity and natural gas. And the vast, vast majority of that electricity and natural gas is going directly towards buildings. There's just one energy code for the entire state. Um, currently, state law prohibits municipalities such as Minneapolis from setting a higher standard. These caps are driven by status quo organizations that are going to say, oh, you want to do this? No, you can't. But I do know that as a city, we definitely, we would like the authority to set more stringent energy efficiency standards because we also think it saves money for our, our residents and our businesses. So from that standpoint, you get kind of, you either have to do incentives, which costs money, or you do things like Minneapolis did, which they require, as you know, buildings to um, report their energy use. So for instance, we could, looking at the data that's reported, ex identify a pool of buildings that both use a lot of energy and also use energy inefficiently. And those are the buildings where you can get the most bang for your buck in terms of outreach. So if you identify that pool of buildings and then you work with the utilities to bring the utilities into the room, into a conversation with those building owners, and some of them haven't had those conversations. And then the city's also there asking, what can we as a city do to help out? Perhaps some ideas will come out. Perhaps there's existing resources those buildings aren't currently using. One of the biggest sources of money to reduce the overall cost of a project is from utility conservation programs. And those can be hard to navigate. SB 2030 is Minnesota's version of the 2030 challenge, by the way. Participation in B3 and then meeting the SB 2030 energy efficiency standards is required for a certain subset of buildings in the state. To achieve it, your building needed to reduce its fossil fuel use by 50%. And then every five years it goes up 10% until it's, car until, uh, it's carbon neutral. And we have a law here in Minnesota that all uh, state-funded projects are required to meet it. But when you look around here, um, you know, the vast majority of the buildings you can see out of the window haven't received any type of state financial assistance. So uh, they're not required to participate in the B3 program. I think there's a, there's a few things that we as a city could do, and many of these are identified in our climate action plan too. One potential is to, again, we have this lead building policy for any city-owned building. Uh, a pop, we could uh, amend that policy so that there is more, uh, it's more stringent. And then also take the SB 2030 criteria. This would be a heavy, really heavy lift, but can you imagine having every local government required to meet that with their buildings? County governments, county, county buildings, municipal buildings, all schools, everything. And then, uh, you know, what might be feasible would be to offer free energy audits to everyone. So we think that we need to take a more active role in reaching out to these high users, um, but it require, that requires more uh, staff.
So the elected officials ultimately have the say in, in what those programs are, and then we as staff, you know, use those resources to um, provide as much programming and assistance as we can. Maybe this is what I'll leave you with, is that we could completely uh, decarbonize our electric system. We could turn all of our on-road vehicles, all of our transportation to electricity and make that all come from renewable resources. But if we are still left with the same amount of natural gas we use, we won't hit our 80% reduction. Standards are so mundane and they're so like down to earth, they are powerful. If you put them together, you can change the world with standards.